Hello everybody, it's Justin with Shock Therapy and we are blessed with this interview with Jake Carver. He is a professional UTV driver. This guy right here has an impressive resume. At least two wins in Best in the Desert, one win, Baja 1000, six podiums, maybe more if Ish. you actually stopped yeah. and counted, you have at least that. Yeah. Um, so needless to say, his resume is very impressive and anything that he can give you or us at all at, for advice, you should probably follow it. <laughs> now, just last week, uh, Jake podiumed third place in the Baja 500. Um, how about we start with this? A lot of people ha have heard everything they've uh, ever heard about Baja or the 500 or the 1000 or San Felipe or any other race. Um, they've just heard people chatting up how rough it is or what it's like. Um, is there any way you can put into words exactly what the 500 was like this year because it changes every year the course is different sometimes they run yeah. it forward sometimes they run it backwards sometimes they pick the rough stuff sometimes they pick the rougher stuff i've never seen them pick easy stuff what would you describe this race like uh like getting hit by a freight train <laughs> that, that's the only thing i could come up with um this race was just brutal i mean i've raced a lot of races i've raced all the stateside races I've raced the 1000, I've raced the 500, I've raced all the tough races there are to race in a UTV. And I think that this race tops them all by far. Um, you know, the, the silt, the rocks, the, um, you know, the silt climbs, which is an aspect that is seen pretty much in no stateside races. You got silt, but you don't have the silt hill climbs. Um, you know, and the, the whoops are just undescribable you can't there's no way to put into words how big a four foot whoop is you think of a four foot whoop you know people have been to the dunes people have been out on you know stateside race courses and they think that you know their their stock turbo razor is gonna just rip through the whoops and you know and because they will mm -hmm. you go to Baja and my race car is bottoming out over whoops at 15 miles an hour lots high centering time, yeah lots of times you can't get on top you're just ass front back forth the whole way i mean you can't there's nothing you can do to help your car get over it other than hold it to the floor and hope for the best and so. and the car better be built strong for that because the back tires in the air the things on the rev limiter between every yeah. single one of them you could almost call a four foot whoop miniature jumps yeah absolutely and, and, and you can't time a jump ramp to the next right. jump ramp to the next jump ramp it's just an impossible thing that makes you pissed mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're trying to double them as much as you can, uh, you know, just like a, a super cross whoop section. Um, and you're trying to get a rhythm. And then as soon as you have one that's maybe it's 10 feet away instead of eight or whatever that is, uh, it just screws up your whole rhythm. And then you're bouncing nose, you know, ass up, nose down, just trying to get through it without wrecking and holding it to the floor. Because if you slow down, it makes it worse. So, um, you know, the, the whoops are by far the biggest aspect of Baja, I think. Um, and then, you know, the rocks, there's rocks everywhere, but there's not rocks with silt and with a hill climb and with whoops. And that's, that's the real thing in Baja, I think, is, um, you know, the, it, it's all of them combined. It's not one or the other or, you know, a little bit of both in different areas. It's all of them in one area. And right when you think you're out of it, you hit another one and then another one. So. Right. Like, so for instance, in uh, the you know, state side, you might end up in Parker, which is sandy whoops, mm -hmm. sandy wash, um, some mountain sections that have some rough rock that's buried in it, but sure. you pretty much have one or the other. Yeah. Um, and you go to Baja and you end up with sandy whoops, sandy wash, <laughs> throw rocks yeah. buried in it, boulders buried in it, um, silt buried in it, mm -hmm. um, silt climbing out of one wash, going into another wash, yep. and then the worst rocks you're ever gonna find on a hill climb that they should only throw Jeeps up or goats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then That's it's narrow. Trail. I mean, I don't even know how yeah. you can fit, barely fit a UTV through some of the sections where there's a boulder sticking out of the mountain and the mm -hmm. trail is gone on the right hand side with a 500 foot drop. I don't even know how they fit a trophy truck through some of that stuff. Yeah, it's impressive for trucks to go through that stuff. I mean, I have a hard time. My car's, you know, 75 inches wide and a trophy truck's around the 91 range and there, I can't imagine going through it in that. Um, you know, I, I think the big whoops obviously are, are better in a truck, but 
um, the tight stuff, you know, the goat trail and all that stuff, you know, that's, that's one piece. Everybody knows the goat trail cause it's, you know, it's an easy spot to video. Mm -hmm. Everyone's seen it. Everybody understands it. But when you get on the backside of Mike Sky Ranch, it's a, it's a thousand goat trails. I mean, it's, um, it's not one little trail that you, you know, you crawl over some rocks and go down to a highway. It's goat trail down, goat trail up. I mean, just, it just never stops. It's just right. right when you think you're in the clear, you're not, you're not even close. So. Describe your race, uh, getting to where you could finish in third place. Um, how did the start, say the first 100 miles go? First 100 miles was actually real solid for our race. Um, you know, we started, I think, 25th. Uh, you know, we, we kept a conservative pace for the first, you know, 50 miles, I would say for sure. Uh, in 20 miles, we had passed three cars broken down already. And, you know, I, I always, uh, as much as you want to laugh at them, you've been there before, so mm -hmm. it's hard to laugh at them. You go, man, that sucks. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, we've all been there and you know, it, it's hard in a race like that because everyone wants to win the 50th anniversary Baja 500. I mean, nobody goes out there to, you know, people say they go to finish, but they go to win. I mm -hmm. mean, nobody goes there to say, oh, I finished 20th place. I mean, it's, I want to win that race. And if I finish great, but I want to win. And, uh, you know, we, we kept a real conservative pace for the first 50 miles, just started picking off cars. We got passed once or twice by the guys that um, thought they were going to win it in the first 50 miles. Mm -hmm. And we let them go by happily. Uh, you know, I pulled over for several guys. Uh, and then you've also got the aspect of the guys that think they can pass you and they're hitting the push to pass just because they see your dust a mile ahead. Yeah. And they're trying to screw with you. So you really got to you really got to pick who you let over, you know, you, you're, you don't want to block people cause that's wrong. Cause you hate it when you get blocked, mm -hmm. but at the same time you want to, uh, you know, you don't want to let somebody overtake you just because they happen to see your dust. Cause you see 10 people's dust in front of you, you know? Right. So, so. for those who don't know in score, they use a, a tracking system called the Stella and the Stella unit is a GPS system. It's tracking every single car. It's telling you when you have speed zones and the speed limit that you have to manage, it's also telling you whether, you've hit a virtual checkpoint or VCP, which they place in specific places to keep people from cutting the course. But the interesting thing about it is that it has communication between every other car, Stella. So as you come up to somebody, instead of having to honk and mm -hmm. tap them, and if they don't move, hit them harder, you can come up and you can press a push to pass button, mm -hmm. basically on the Stella, which tells that car, hey, there's someone behind you that wants to pass. And they can actually say, press a button and acknowledge it and tells you that they know that you're there. And so that maybe would keep you from having to bang their bumper off the car just to get them out of the way that you realize they're going to get out of the way. So it makes the racing a little bit safer. It probably saves a lot more rear bumpers, but it also, like Jake was saying, makes people uh, use it when it shouldn't be used. You know, they might be half a mile behind you and they're going to press that push to pass button and hope you think that they're closer you pull over mm -hmm. and that guy wasn't ever anywhere near you or shouldn't even have the right to pass you yet. He has to work a lot harder to get closer. And that's what you're fighting. Yeah. Well, and you know, there's a lot of what everybody calls log jams in the first, you know, 50 miles. Usually this race was actually great compared to past years, but there was still areas where you had to stop because the silt was so bad or the dust was so bad or someone was stuck in front of you. So when you stop the five cars behind you, are right on you, right? I mean, they're 10 seconds behind you. So they're hitting the button. So your things just flash and telling you to pull over. And you're like, I had to stop too. I'm not going to just let you pass. You, you caught me because I stopped. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and it wasn't my fault. I didn't stop because I was broken. I stopped because mm -hmm. someone in front of me was broken. So there's, there's just a lot of um, aspects in the, in the first 50 miles of the race that your mind's going crazy. I mean, there's speed zones. You're trying to, you're trying to go exactly 37 miles an hour because if you're going 35 and the guy behind you is going 37 in the first speed zone that's 10 miles. He's passing you yeah, on the highway. Exactly. He's mm -hmm. catching you. And <laughs> I actually passed Brandon his speed zone that way. It was Did great. Did you? Oh, yeah. In this race? Oh, yeah. In this race. It, he was uh, pretty <laughs> bummed about it. <laughs> and, and, and that's Brandon Sims, if you guys don't know. And by the way, they're really good friends. So the speed zone, I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody's seen the, uh, the videos of, of a couple teams that were battling due to some speed zone issues. So you got to really pay attention. I mean, the first especially the first speed zone because you know there's been past years that i thought i was in a speed zone and i got blown by by two cars and then you're like at first you think they're speeding but then 
really you're the one you're the idiot that's getting passed mm -hmm. and then you're pissed which is exactly what happened in that video everyone's seen mm -hmm. so one of the races that we were in in the speed zone when the, well, the first year that they were using the stella another mm -hmm. car had found out that when you hit your speed limit and the stella tells you hey it's 37 miles an hour if you go 37.5 it starts flashing and telling you mm -hmm. that you're going too fast slow down well, the, the, this other team had figured out that you get five to 10 seconds of messing up in order to recover to that mile an hour <laughs> yeah. before it dinks you a penalty. Right. So we're doing 37 mile an hour spot on and a car goes right around us. Well, all he was doing was going 38 miles an hour during that five second leeway and slowed right back mm -hmm. down to 37. And then he would jump another 100 yards and play, yeah. the, play the leeway game. And I think they've tightened that up a little bit, but it's super yeah. frustrating when you're trying to follow it yeah. and then somebody else is playing the game. Yeah, because in all reality, if someone wants to take that penalty mm -hmm. that they may or may not get caught on, they can pass you. And you know, if you're going the speed limit, they can pass you and overtake your position. And then, and then you're pissed because you don't want to get the penalty, but at the same time, you just, you're gonna be in their dust. So, yeah. um, so you know, the first, the first 50 miles of, of these Baja races just, I mean, it's, it's um it's wrenching just to just to be in it and just to try to keep your car alive because you want to floor it like everybody else but but you can't so you know we we kept a real conservative pace we did get past um but we also did a lot of passing to the people who were passing us there were several people that went around us and a mile later we were waving at them on the side of the course so they were um, over driving yeah so they you know you got to be you got to be careful um and we would get, you know, we would get past the 50 mile mark and then that's when we start kind of speeding up. Uh, you know, you're starting, people are starting to spread out. You can see, you can um, really start, you know, putting your skills to work rather than just guessing. And, um, you know, from there we just, we just started to power down and, you know, we, we made some good headway on people, but there were still people catching us and, you know, the 50 to 100 mile mark. And I thought we were running maybe 10th, 15th physically because mm -hmm. we started 25th mm -hmm. and you know at race mile about I think let's see here race mile 70 ish that's at the when, road crossing for fuel yep at the road I could see Sims behind me and I knew he was catching us and I knew he was driving hard in the first 50 miles so mm -hmm. I was like all right well fair enough you know game on <laughs> so uh so we're in the speed zone we see him pull off for pits and then we pulled off in our pit after and right when I was pulling back onto the highway he went right by me. So I was right behind him, you know, mm -hmm. 10 feet behind him. So we're going down. Tap. Yeah, I thought about it, but <laughs> he was going right 37, so I couldn't catch him. Mm. So we're going and I see up ahead, you know, that there's a, there's a traffic jam. Uh, Cause you're on the highway with everyone. Yeah. I mean, there's chase trucks, there's locals, there's mm -hmm. everybody is on the highway. So, I mean, it's just like if you were driving through downtown Phoenix and a traffic jam starts, what do you do? You hit the brakes, right? Mm. So I see the traffic jam ahead. So I get in the left lane. And Brandon's looking at, you know, he's looking at his speed and he's trying to go exactly 37. Well, the cars in front of him go down to about 30. I blow right by him and three other cars and pull in in front of him. So I see him whip it out behind me. And he's like, you know, I'm sure me and my co-driver are just cracking up. We're just like, what an idiot. And he's smacking the steering wheel. <laughs> yeah, and he's his, punching his, his co-driver's helmet. too. Yeah, and we're just laughing our asses mm -hmm. off. So, so we get in front of him. And we're like, perfect, we got our spot back. No, no harm, no foul, no speeding penalty. You know, we stayed 37 the whole way, never lifted. You know, we we're in the wrong, wrong lane of traffic there for a second, but there was no cars coming, it was safe. So uh, all was good. And then, you know, we got into the dirt section. So after race mile 75, you get off the highway and you head on the north side. And yep. from 75 to about 105, maybe 100. Yep. It's fast and fun. Oh, yeah. Probably the most fun yeah. section of all the 500. Where you can stretch yeah. your legs, you can you know, cars mm -hmm. work in, you can you can um, you actually instead of running 30, 40, 50 miles an hour, you mm -hmm. get some 70, 80, 90 miles stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. So we pull out off the highway onto the dirt, and I just absolutely floored. I mean, I've got him five feet off my back bumper, and I'm like, mm -mm, not today. So <laughs> I take off, I hold it to the floor. We're going 75, 80 through the wash, just as fast as my car, you know, can push in the sand. And, you know, there was, there was a class five car, a 12 car, two UTVs. I mean, it's hectic. There's, and it's, it's a four lane highway. So everyone's trying to win to that, to that pinch point. Yeah. And luckily I, I passed all the other cars that were there and I got around all of them 
And I don't know what happened behind me, but I was like, don't you put care. put them between you and Brandon. <laughs> yeah. The more cars you put in between you and the next guy in your class, the yeah. better off you are, hands yeah. down. So, so we kept going. You know, I didn't see him for a while. And then maybe 10 miles later, I start getting caught by him. And I'm like, okay, all right, good. We'll, uh, we'll go for it. So, so then we power down, and I lose my front drivetrain. Oh, right, no. right out of the gate. I mean, probably mile 100. Like kaboom, um, or just stop driving. L it it lost made pull. some pretty loud noises mm. and pretty much stopped pulling. It mm. was, you know, there's anyone who knows the diffs. You know, they can slip and they kind of they clack Lock every and now ratchet. and then. Mm. Um, but mine was like a like a grinding gear ratchet. It wasn't mm. like a couple clicks. It was like a grrr, just complete slippage. So, mm. so I'm down to two wheel drive. Going all right. Well, this sucks. Yeah. So. Especially with yeah. silty hill climbs. Yeah, and, and, and rocky. miles in of 600 miles almost, right? Right, so, right. Um, so we're like, all right, well, so we radioed to our pits, tell them get a diff ready. You know, we're going to swap it. Well, you know, we get halfway in, race mile 80, or race mile 180 comes, comes and goes. You know, everyone with smaller fuel tanks, hence the two-seater that we were racing, mm -hmm. has to pull over and pit. So we go by them, and we're doing well. Um, you know, we're, we're like, well, hey, you know what? Maybe two-wheel drive isn't the worst thing. It's, it's probably keeping us, our speed down a little bit. So you stretched it in two-wheel yeah. drive from the 180 mm -hmm. to the northern loop and yep. where it was hot, and then back down to 220 at the road crossing again? Yep, yeah, so we're, we're cooking along. Um, you know, after, after everyone pulls off at the 180 pit, we pass probably another five cars sitting in the pit. Um, and we're, we're like, well, all right, we're not doing too bad. So we keep rolling. And then, um, about race mile 190, um, I passed Wayne Matlock, mm -hmm. who last I heard to my knowledge was in the physical lead. And I'm like, how'd you end up there? Yeah. I'm yeah. like, I thought we were like 10th maybe. Mm -hmm. And then I start thinking, wow, how, how long has he been sitting there? Right. Has mm -hmm. he been you know, so it's playing a mind game. You're like, has he been sitting there 10 minutes or did he just break down and we're that far up, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's really hard to, it's really hard to know where you're at, especially when you don't have comms for your team to tell you. So the radios in Baja don't work everywhere. They work yeah. at the pits. And so you pretty much yeah. run 80% of the race without any comm. Yeah, exactly. So, so we pass him and I'm like, wow, we're, we're probably doing pretty well right now. And then of course, Right after that, I smash a huge rock because I'm excited and driving too fast. And <laughs> there goes a wheel and tire, you know, right off the back. So, oh. so we pull over to change it. And there goes Matlock right back by us. There goes Brandon right back by us. There goes two other cars right back by us. Mm. And so we're like, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. freaking out. So change the wheel and tire. Um, you know, it was completely my fault. It wasn't the product we were running or anything. I just smashed a rock harder than any rock can be smashed. At least you missed like 10,000 rocks before that because yeah. they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I was pretty bummed, um, but you know, that's racing. So, so we put the new one on the car, take off. And you know, at that point we're probably, you know, it probably takes a solid two to five minutes to do that. And everybody else is holding this to the floor while you're sitting there. So yeah. at that point we're, you know, we're back a little bit and I know it, but, um, you know, I, I'm thinking to myself, should we change a diff? Do we need four wheel drive to catch everyone now? Or can we mm -hmm. do it in two wheel drive? I don't know. You know, I, I have no idea where everyone's at. So we roll through the whole San Felipe whoop or San Felipe loop. Which was after 220. So from 200 to two, 220 is really brutal rock. Oh yeah. Narrow single track yep. in and out of a wash. Mm -hmm. And then at 220, you run a little bit of highway and get on the south side of the road, which is the north end of San Felipe. And everybody knows mm -hmm. San Felipe has nasty whoops. And that section has two footers that all of a sudden turn mm -hmm. into threes. And then out of the middle of nowhere, they go to fours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and exactly. two-wheel drive, that's even worse. Yeah, oh yeah, because th that's the great thing about UTVs is the four-wheel drive. I think that's what makes our class competitive with many of the, you know, the 10 cars and yeah. the 12 cars and all these other cars that start in front of us. They've only got two wheel drive and in Baja, four wheel drive is huge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we just lost our biggest advantage in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're thinking to ourselves, me and my co-dog are going back and forth saying, should we change it? Should we not? We don't want to lose the time. You're you know. looking at, you know, 15 minutes on the fast oh. end of things. And actually, no, I take it back because yeah. uh, on a Millen chassis, even worse. Yeah, Never you, mind. Unfortunately, this chassis, it's a great chassis. Everything is very mm -hmm. low center mm -hmm. of gravity, 
but the radiator is lowered. Yeah. And to pull a front diff, you have to pull the whole cooling system, and meaning the radiator. And they're hard to bleed cool, yeah. and deal with that after you're looking at an so hour like, at least. Yeah, we're thinking yeah. an hour to two hours to change mm -hmm. out this front diff, and we're like, man, is it really worth it? If we're in 10th place, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know. So we get to the next pit and we pull in and, and my pit guys say, man, you're running physically third, you're doing great. And I'm like, what? Uh, and they've got a diff sitting there and I'm like, whoa, don't, don't, don't change, change that diff. <laughs> what, what are we running there? Yeah. Like physically third. And I'm like, all right, game on, we're still in it. So, so that's probably 250, which means you hit Mike's road right after that. Yeah. You, so you went up to Mike's and then you got into the hell hole. Yeah, so this whole time my front, my front drivetrain is just clanking and clacking and when we're sitting in that pit I said all right well we don't have front drive mm. so I just turned it off so yeah. went into two-wheel drive so then you know not pre-running I don't know what's next I, I'm just thinking hopefully it's not silt hopefully mm -hmm. it's um you know what we just went through because we made it fine in two-wheel drive whatever um even though it was brutal but so we take off go down the road um and then we hook a left on the Mike Sky Ranch Road which I had no idea that's where we were turning, but I've been on the road before mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, cool. The highest speed rally course, the rally style road on the entire course that you can do 80 mile an hour around corners and have four wheel drive just pulling you out of it. Mm -hmm. I've got two wheel drive. Yeah. So it was a little bit dis disheartening, but um, you know, we dealt with it. So we, we just held it to the floor and had some fun drifting. I mean, it was uh, more drifting than I think I've ever done in that car before because I'm usually in four wheel drive, but uh, but we had a lot of fun, so. And then after Mike's, between Mike's and uh, the West Coast at about race mile 370, it's horribly slow and rock crawly, mm -hmm. Jeep trail, super narrow, cliff so on the deep. right, mountain on the left. Yeah. In two wheel drive. Yeah, so we're, you know, we're crawling down the rocks after we get up to Mike's Sky and we're kind of coming back down. You know, we're crawling up and down the rocks and I'm like, you know what? Rocks aren't that bad in two wheel drive. As long as you keep your momentum up, we're good. And then of course we come to the first silt hill and I'm like, huh, cool. And there's, there's two cars stuck on it. So we're sitting there in two wheel drive watching two wheel drive cars get stuck. And we're like, well, this is, this is great. So I clicked it into four wheel drive thinking whatever it can do it. to me it is going to be better than two wheel drive unless mm -hmm. it locks up, of course. But I was like, it, it's got to do something, um, you know, whether that's just the the bare minimum or whatever, it, it's got to be better than two wheel drive. So click it into four wheel drive, let a couple cars clear, put it in low and just hammer down up the hill. We get to the very top right when my front tires are cresting and the back end just starts sinking in. And oh, I'm no. like, oh, here we go. We're not making it. And I'm just floored. I mean, not even mm -hmm. not even thinking about lifting. I'm like, whatever. I'm either going to bury myself or make it. And uh, at that point, right when we're about to get stuck, I'm not kidding you, the front drive just clicked once and grabbed just enough to pop us up over the hill. And then my car died. And I'm like, what the, what just happened? So depression, elation, mm -hmm. back to depression. Yeah, and I'm like, oh my God, here we go again, another issue. Um, so, you know, I turn the car off, think it's just, you know, maybe it's something weird, right? Cause it's running like crap, um, you know, so I start back up, still running like crap, check engine light flicks on, I check the code, misfire code. So I'm like, wow, I wonder what, why would it be misfiring right now? You know, did I get bad gas in Mexico? What did I get? You know, what's going on? And, and it's really hard when you're out there and you're, you're trying to, you're trying to be fast, but you're trying to also think straight and wonder what's going on. Um, so I said, you know what, I'll get out. And my co-driver's like, you want me to get out? I'm like, no, I'll get out. You know, I know, I know the car really well. I prepped the whole thing myself. So, um, so I get out and I'm kind of looking around and I see that the coil that's mounted right above my intake plenum is broken off just laying there on top of the fuel line. So I'm like, oh, well, that's gotta be part of the problem. And then I look down a little bit more and notice the spark plug wires unplugged. So I'm like, okay, all right, well, here's the problem. Found the problem, that was easy. So I plug it all back in, tell my co-driver, hey, grab the zip ties out of the tool bag. And he says, what zip ties? Uh oh. Zip ties are in tool bag. There's always zip ties in the tool bag. Everybody carries zip ties. Uh, nope, not your tool bag. <laughs> I'm like, okay, perfect, perfect. Just what we need right now. So uh, we didn't have zip ties. We had them, but I don't know if someone took them out or what happened, but for whatever reason, they weren't in my, weren't in my bag. So, you know, there's a, there's a bracket that holds that coil on 
And at this point, it's a metal jagged knife looking piece mm -hmm. that's sitting on top of my fuel line that feeds the car. Yeah. And all of the insulation around the fuel line is already cut off because it already had been smashing. So I'm like, well, the next thing to happen is to cut the fuel line and spray fuel all over the motor that's going to ignite. So mm -hmm. that's great. But what choice do we have? We were, you know, between mile 270 and 370 crossing the peninsula, nobody around, you know, other than stuck cars, which they're, they're dealing with their own issues. So did you tape it up and wing it? No, didn't tape it up. Just plugged it in and left it, <laughs> <laughs> left it sitting right on top of the fuel line and said, all right. I told my co-driver, I said, here's a fire extinguisher. If the car dies, jump out and put it out. And he's like, what? I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. We'll lose fuel pressure when it cuts it. So you'll know. You'll know. I said, it's got a fire suppression system. Go for it. <laughs> and he's like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, well, we don't have, what choice do we have? Right? So, so we take back off, um, get up the next hill, you know, we're cruising, you know, the whole time in the back of my mind, I'm thinking this thing's going to light up any minute, you know, I'm, I'm worried about it, but again, don't have a choice. So we keep rolling. We get, um, I don't know, mile 300 ish and car dies. Both of us bail out, hit the floor. <laughs> fire. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We think it's fire. I can see like when I looked back, I could see, you know, our yellow flashing light. I thought it was flames. Yeah. So we both just hit the deck, get out. Nothing's wrong. It just came unplugged. It didn't cut it or anything. So plug it back in, both get back in, take back off. Um, then there's another log jam, of course. So there's a couple cars tried going around. We just kind of waited our turn and, and went through, went through the pack, went up the hill. Um, and then from there, it was, it was nasty rocks, silt hill climbs, the, the typical mm -hmm. Baja saga for um, the rest of the distance till we got to race mile 370. Fuel at 370 at the yep. road crossing and yep. then hop onto the beach section, go north along the ocean for the next 30 miles or so, a little bit yep. more flat track. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was a huge, um, huge break <laughs> for us. <laughs> Every time you hit the road section at the beginning of the race, you're like, God, I hate road sections. Why do they put so many of them on there? And then when you're in the race and you hit them, you're like, you pray for them. Oh, thank <laughs> God. We're on a road section. <laughs> I'm so sick of that crap that's behind us. So, but then you only get 20 or 30 miles of nice beach road yeah. and then it gets back into the mountains again and yep. that's got a ton of silt in it. Yeah. Do you have any silt issues with two wheel drive over there? Um, we, we came close to having lots of issues, but again, I was trying to save it cause I knew it was grinding, leave it in two wheel drive, um, go as far as we could. And then once we saw a silt hill, click it into four wheel drive for whatever help it was going to give us and take a run at it. Mm -hmm. We got, uh, we did get to one area that we got stuck and my co-driver had to get out, push us backwards and give it another shot. But, um, you know, it, it was a battle the whole time. It was never, oh, we made that one easy. It was always, oh, are we going to make it? we going to make it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Just holding it to the floor, spitting rocks out behind us, just hoping for the best. Did so. you feel like a class 11 for the first time ever in UTV? <laughs> I did. <laughs> I felt like <laughs> even worse, it seemed like. I'm sure those guys go through way worse than what we do, but I felt, oh. um, I felt very underpowered and very underprepared for Baja, which mm. you always feel that way. But well, you've been there a ton. It doesn't yeah. matter how many times mm. you've been there. It's still the case almost every time. Yep, absolutely. So, so we got through that. Um, you know, we went to our next pit, pit uh, or race mile 470. Mm -hmm. uh, everything went well there, fueled up. Everything, everybody said car looked good. My guys were all there and ready to rock. So that would be Europan. And then you head up over the mountain after that. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, every 500 I've raced, you go on your last road section, mm -hmm. you go into the last, you know, 60 miles of the course. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty much, you know, half of it's what you've already done on the way out and half of it's just getting through a host and stuff. So it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was completely wrong. different. Oh yeah. They changed it. <laughs> I had no idea what we were about to go through. It was, uh, <coughs> it was absolutely treacherous. I mean, <coughs> the, the rocks, again, the hill climbs, the silt, the just everything was horrible. And we talked about it earlier, um, off camber silt ruts mm -hmm. that if you came in half a mile an hour too fast and on oh, the yeah. brakes, that would pick up a back tire and roll you. Yeah. Luckily, my car is um, very low center of gravity. This chassis is designed, you know, kind of around rally. And 
um, it's it's very it does very good in situations like that. So I wasn't real worried about that. I think I lifted a tire once, so that wasn't my problem. My problem was, um, you know, my problem was the just the silt being in two wheel drive and and the long <coughs> hill climbs and and mentally not being prepared for it. I was thinking that um, you know I was home free, and then from 470 to 520, where was which was our next flyby was absolutely horrible. I told my guys when I left 470, yeah, see you in a half hour. Oh, mm-hmm. boy, was I wrong. Mm-hmm. I, it was, I don't know, two hours maybe yeah. of just kicking our asses the whole way, just completely destroying the car, what I thought. I could just hear everything clanking and cracking and squeaking, and I was just ready for you know a wheel to fly off at any moment. Uh, but luckily we we made it through I, I don't know how but we did <laughs> when you got to the last say 30 miles you cross the host and you pretty uh-huh. much know the next section because you ran it on the way out yep and i would probably say that's almost a break compared yeah. to what you had just been through in the last 25 or 30 miles yeah did you have any idea do you were you getting time splits do you know where you stood yeah so actually when we rolled through pit uh or race mile 470 there was, there was one other competitor, minus the two that, that beat us, um, that I thought was in front of me. And I asked my guys, I said, hey, how far in, ahead is he? And he said, five minutes. So I think they're talking about this other guy. Is that so, Wayne? No, I, I think they're talking about uh, Alex, okay. who has another Reese Millen chassis. Mm-hmm. And so I think I'm fourth physically at this point. Mm-hmm. And they say, he's five minutes ahead of you. And I'm like, oh, crap, all right, well, we got to make it up on him. And then we go through all of the garbage from 470 to 520. Yeah. Then we, we go through 520 and I ask my guys, hey, where's Alex? And they're like, who's Alex? Cause it's a different crew, right? Cause yeah. we went across yeah. the peninsula again. So it's a different crew. They're like, who's Alex? I'm like, he's the guy in front of me. No, just Matlock and Brandon are in front of you. And I'm like, are you sure? They're like, yeah, we're sure. And I told my co-driver, they don't know what they're talking about. Alex is up there. So we're just flooring it, trying to, you know, the last 30 miles, yeah. I'm like, this is my time to make it count. If I want a podium, yeah. I'm gonna have to hold it to the floor and pass this guy that's five minutes up on me, right? Meanwhile, you probably passed him in the silt when you couldn't see. Yeah, meanwhile, he had a problem back at like 420 or something like that. Uh-huh. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, so, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, man, this sucks, we're so close to a podium. You know, what can we do to get there? And so I'm just going as fast as I can. And uh, we reach, let's see here, we reach, you know, the speed zone coming into town, going back into Ensenada, and I see a flashing light up in front of me. I'm like, there he is, I Mm -hmm. see him. So, you know, we're going 37 on the dot, just, you know, trying to stay exact, and then you'll hit, it'll click 38 for a second. So you hit your brakes, then you're down to 33. So it's just like, you know, right up to the end of this race, we're just sitting there going, come on, come on, come on. And then we get to the wash where speed zone's off. I hold it to the floor and I'm like, I'm catching him, I'm catching him. Get to it, it's a buggy. And I'm like, <laughs> no, that's, that's a freaking buggy. Mm. That's not who we're looking for. <clears throat> but I passed him coming into town, went around him, and then, you know, hit the other speed zone, slid sideways into the finish line, you know, the, the whole bit. And then uh, I see the car in front of me and I'm like, that, that's not who I thought it was. That's the guys that were supposed to beat me. So. I don't know what happened to the guy. I think he, I heard he broke back in the 400 somewhere, but um, you know. Was that the moment that you knew you got third or did you have to wait till the next day to even think you were close? Well, my guys came up and they said, we think you're third. And I'm like, well, hold on, I just finished. There's a lot of guys that started behind me. You know, there I was 25th-ish mm-hmm. out of 35 cars. So there's guys that, you know, started 10 minutes behind me that could still be coming in. So we sat there for, you know, 10 minutes while the guys in front of us kind of did their, you know, podium speech or whatever. And um, nobody came in, nobody came in. So we went up on the box, you know, did our little thank you to our sponsors and everything. And, uh, and then no one still came in. We went down the podium and we're like, all right, well, I think, I think we got it. 20 minutes. But here's the kicker. We had, through the whole race, we probably had five to six VCPs, virtual checkpoints, that didn't click on my car. Mm. And we turned around for every single one of them. We would pass it and my co-driver would say, hey, it didn't click. And you know, I'm cussing him saying, what the, why, why didn't you put me through the VCP? He's like, we went right through it. Mm. It didn't click. So, you know, I'm spinning around. I mean, it literally happened five to six times. We spun around, went through it. One of them, we went back, turned around, went forward, went back again, went forward, 
went back a third time and it still didn't click and I said, I'm out, whatever, I'm done. So I kept going and said, you know, our GPS was tracking, so I figured I could prove it that way. Sure. They could so, look back and see that you actually tried. Exactly. Yeah. So we go down the, you know, go down the podium at the finish line and you can check on your tracker which VCPs you missed. So I said, check them. I want to show these guys right now yeah. what we did. And he checked them and he's like, you know, because I'm still thinking if we get a penalty right now, we, we lose third, right? right. So um, he checks him and he's like, that's weird. I'm like, what's weird? And he's like, we hit all of them. I'm like, what do you mean we hit all of them? We turned around for like five of them and you told me they never clicked. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, they didn't, but we hit them. It shows that we hit them. Mm. And I'm like, cool, all right, well, I guess we're safe. I guess it just didn't beep. You know, we hit it, but it didn't beep out loud, so we didn't know. So, um, you know, the technology kind of kind of screwed us there for a minute, but, um, you know, not that that was the difference in our in our position, but it was definitely a part of it. So, um, so at that point, you know, I was pretty sure I was third, but I didn't know for sure. You know, th there's always something that can happen. You yeah. know, maybe that one time your tracker clicked 38 when you're supposed to go 37, you got a penalty, or maybe the five times it did it, yeah. you got a penalty, right? So, yeah. um, so it's really hard to know what position you're in, and we just kind of waited. You know, I checked results the the whole night until we went to bed at 3 a.m. Woke back up at seven to start packing up and leaving and checked for results again, nothing there, nothing there. So finally, I'm like, let's just drive down to, you know, the scoring trailer and see, and, you know, I, I can't leave Baja not knowing if I got a podium, you know? And uh, so we drive down there and we walk up and there's unofficial results on the wall and it shows me third. So at that point I was like, all right, solid. We got third, you know, unofficially, but we got third. And I walked down to the scoring trailer and the lady, um, you know, at that point it's like 11.45, awards are at 12. And the lady's like, yeah, we don't have official results. I'm like, awards are in 15 minutes. You know that, right? <laughs> and she's like, oh, I know, we're trying. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. So I wait around for 15 minutes and then they finally come out with official results and got my trophy and stuff. So it was all Congratulations. good. Congratulations. Uh, everybody yeah, says just finishing is good enough, but uh, podiuming is uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's a good feeling. I would have loved to have won, won the 50th anniversary, but you know, with, with the issues that we had, you know, every time I tell someone the issues we had, they're like, wow, mm -hmm. you still hit a podium? And third. Yeah. I'm like, well, we, we pushed it hard. Trust me. <laughs> we didn't, uh, we didn't cruise to a third place. We put that car to work and, um, you know, I, I'm stoked that we, we got there. So, well, we're going to switch gears a little bit now that we've got the okay. 500 behind us and kind of, uh, let people know a little bit about you with some personal questions, but sure. just so that you know what the rules are, <laughs> if we uh, we ask you a question, and you're going to dance around it. Then you get the hat. The hat has way more embarrassing questions than anything I'm asking you right now. So you might want to answer th everything that we have to say. Okay. Okay. So first thing, we're going to start easy. Where are you born and raised? Uh, Prescott Valley, Arizona. Well, I guess Prescott, Arizona, because there's not a hospital in Prescott Valley. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I was I, I was born there, uh, raised there, and didn't leave until I was 18 years old to go to college. And you and Brandon Sims are buddies. Obviously, he's in Prescott as well. You guys yep. grew up a little bit together and mm -hmm. do a little bit of racing together. Do you yep. guys share any race secrets? Uh, do you try and keep them from each other? <laughs> we try to keep them from each other as much <laughs> as possible, although we end up sharing quite a few. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll, we may uh, go out and have a couple beers and uh, leak our secrets to each other, but uh -huh. you know, it's, it's all in fun. So, uh, you know, we, we both know a lot of how each other runs each other's program. And, uh, you know, that, I think that's why we both do pretty well uh, is because we both have had success and we, we do share our secrets and, and we've even raced together. And when we race together, you, you won. definitely know each other's secrets. The yeah. thousand yeah. together. Yep. That's a pretty tight group. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, that, that was a good race. And, you know, we, we raced Brandon's car, so I, I learned a lot about <laughs> his car. Some things that I was actually pretty impressed he's done as well as he has with it, but. <laughs> Who has tapped each other's bumper more? Ooh, um, that's tough. I don't, I don't know that we've, either of us have done it a lot in a race. That is a lie, you get the hat. <laughs> hat please, dancing around a question. Pull and read out loud, sir. When was the last time your parents saw you naked and why? I'm gonna dance around this one too, because you I'm get another. <laughs> you get the hat again. I don't remember. 
Uh, Five seconds, probably, you get another one. Probably when I was 12 years old. And why? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why they saw me naked. Uh, I think that's another hat. Yeah. Out loud, sir. What's the first thing you would do if you woke up one day as the opposite sex? Go get a bunch of free shit. Because chicks get free stuff? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no lying about that. No, not at all. All right, you're safe. You're safe. Let's get back to normal stuff. Thank you for being honest on the hat. <laughs> Did you play any sports when you were growing up? Were you athletic at all? Um, you know, I played t-ball and minor league baseball, yeah. soccer, up until I was old enough to make my own decisions, like five years old, and realize I didn't like that stuff. <laughs> I was like, eh, teams aren't for me. I don't really like any of these guys. So um, I went away from that. When I was nine years old, I started racing BMX, uh, you know, bicycles, and I did really well at it. Then I went into quads, dirt bikes, um, rhinos, believe it or not, back when, back when rhinos were the thing. Um, you know, so I've been UTV racing for a long time. So. so clearly any dirt bike experience has translated to driving these. Oh, absolutely. Um, do you have any workout regimen to try and make sure that you've got the stamina for the long races now? Um, you know, I, I don't have a workout regimen right now. It's uh, something I've always wanted to do to try to get some better stamina. But unfortunately, with working a full-time job, I mean, a real full-time job, not, not 40 hours, 50 to 60 hours. Let's talk about that. So a lot of people have the misconception that a pro driver is basically racing all the time and working on his car, and it's just <laughs> yeah. not the case. No. I mean, it's very, very rare, and I don't think that it's even the case anywhere in mm -hmm. UTV racing. Right. And, and if it is, it's this much right. full time. So um, you've got a real job mm -hmm. and it's not a clock in deal. No. It's, no. it's early in the morning and yep. until it's done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a salary job that I work the hours that it takes to, to get the job done. So, um, you know, I, I don't go in at eight, I go in early and I'm usually there till, you know, six in the evening. Sometimes mm -hmm. I get out of there at five, but mm -hmm. sometimes I don't get out of there till eight. So and you are team mechanic, crew chief, driver, um, yep. financier, mm -hmm. um, basically every single hat you're wearing in the team. So I imagine you leave work and you yep. go home and work on the car. Oh yeah, every night, every weeknight, every weekend. I very rarely take a vacation. My vacation is the days I take off for racing, which could be argued to be another job. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, every night I get home, I work on the car for you know three or four hours, um, you know, tearing it down, prepping it, ordering parts, whatever it takes to to keep my program going. And then the weekend comes, and I still wake up early. I don't sleep in. I wake up at six or seven, um, go out to the shop, and work on my car all weekend. So now um, your girlfriend is your parts runner from time to time. At oh, least yeah. she's come here to pick up parts on many occasion. Oh yeah. If you're working that much on the car, how do you even have time for her? Uh, well, <laughs> she would agree with you that I don't have much time <laughs> for her. But, um, you know, I, I try to balance it as much as possible. And uh, truth be told, I don't have a lot of time for other things. I, uh, I'm pretty much stuck on this race car or at my day job, you know, 20 hours of the 24 hour day and you know there there's time or two that you know I'll take a I'll take an evening off not a weekend day but an evening off and you know she, she likes these kind of things too she likes razors and I think um, being a part of the racing for her is is fun too and you know um, she helps me wash the cars and uh, get get everything ready, whether it's cooking or, mm -hmm. um, you know, that sounded bad, cooking. Um, but w w w whether it's, um, you know, helping me pack or running parts, like you said, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, really the time that I spend with her is, is racing related. So um, um, it's see, tough. No matter what, it's a family affair, no matter yeah. really anybody that we've ever talked to, certainly in the UTV end of things. Mm -hmm. um, how many hours do you think you spend on the car um, per race. So have you ever actually added it up? And, and if you're running both series, you're running 14 races a year. You're mm -hmm. racing once every two weeks, maybe once every three weeks on average. Yeah. So what do you think you throw at the car every three weeks? That, that's a tough one um, because it's a lot. It's probably more than I want to know. I, I don't know that I, I don't well, purposely know. ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, 
you know, three to four hours a night, easy. Mm -hmm. And on the weekends, it's not an eight hour weekend day. You know, it's a, it's a 14 hour day, at least so, sometimes a 16 hour day. So 20 hours during the week yeah. and another 25 yeah. hours on the weekend. It's a mm -hmm. 50 hour, 45 hour easily job. So no matter what, the second job yeah. on top of your first job, it's already a job and a half. Yeah. Yeah, so I have, you know, two and a half, three jobs, <laughs> I guess you could say, but So, so what you're saying is that the racing into things is actually super easy and it's kind of the life. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the racing part is the break. When I get to a race, <laughs> even though it's hectic and, you know, once I'm in the car, I'm like, oh, thank God I'm not prepping anymore or whatever, you know, not ordering things and running around, picking stuff up and just, you know, once you get there, you're like, here we go. And then the day you get home, you know, that's your... That's your one day of rest a month, if that, you know, and sometimes you get home at 10, so you don't get it. Uh, then that's after you haven't slept Yeah. during the yeah. race. Yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely tough, you know, and I think that's why, I, you know, as much as I hate to say it about many of the races, I think that's why so many are unsuccessful, um, you know, because being young, like myself and a few of the other racers, I don't have kids, you know, I, I have a family, but, um, you know, they understand and, and they're willing to, uh, they're willing to deal with it. So others I think, get burned out. Yeah. Others get burned out. Others have kids to take mm -hmm. care of, you know, which is obviously a full-time job in itself. So maybe they have four jobs now. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's really tough. It's really tough to, for people to be successful if they have to have a day job too. So, um, you know, well, speaking of success in the racing end of things, how did you actually get started? And before you even go into that, um, I know that when you're racing your first or second season that you had end up, ended up at one point in time, I think podium, making the podium in over half the races of the season. Yeah. And I know that's what led up to the point where things actually happened for you, but mm -hmm. and that makes it kind of sound easy. Like yeah. You entered, you podiumed, you get a contract. Yeah. <laughs> I know it wasn't that Far easy. Far from that. Yeah. I mean, the, the first year I raced was uh, 2015. It was a naturally aspirated Polaris 1000. Um, that race, the co or that year, should I say, the competition was nothing like it is now. Um, that wasn't the year I did great. That was a year I did okay. I, my third race I ever raced in a Razor, I had won overall UTV. Uh, that was Silver State 300 back in 2015. So, you know, I'm three races in going, this is freaking awesome. You and know? easy. Yeah. And I'm like, this isn't too bad. I don't, I don't know what everybody's problem <laughs> is. You go out there, you prep your car and you win. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, you know, everything just came together for me in that race. And, you know, after that, I was thinking, man, you know, I, I feel like I'm pretty good. I feel like uh, I can keep doing this. And then it was just a landslide of horrible races after that. I won my third race and then lost six after that. I mean, not not, um, you know, third place lost just didn't even come like close to the podium you know dnf yeah dnf 10th place plus um you know bad mm -hmm. so then at the end of that year i actually ended up building a new car because the turbo class was coming and everyone's like oh man why are you building a new car why are you racing why do you want to race turbo i'm like because that's where everybody else is going they're like well what's it matter if you're not winning here and i'm like because I could care less to win against the guys that aren't going anywhere. Mm. I want to win against the guys that do have the factory sponsorships and the guys that are going places and, you know, the guys that actually show that I'm good, right? Because that would make your name if you beat yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. So, so I went to the turbo class and that was the year I did great. You know, everyone was like, oh, I can't believe you're doing that. You're crazy. You're going to waste all this money. You know, I, I had saved up money. I went to college. I... Uh, worked my ass off and saved up as much money as I could paid for 99% of it myself. I had a lot of help or I, I had a little help um, but I paid for absolutely as much of it as I could and um, got luck got lucky and you know put the work in that it took and ended up on the podium four out of seven races. So um, you know, the car I, I spent, again, spent every night in the shop making sure the car was dialed. Everything was there. You know, back then I, I couldn't afford to um, replace a lot of the parts. So, you know, rather than sending my axles off, for example, to get rebuilt, I was taking them apart 
and I was going through each part and you know maybe if a CV needed replaced maybe I could afford to replace the star or the race or one little piece of that puzzle uh, just enough to get me by mm -hmm. you know lots of times I was running on used belts um, you know just just doing what I could to make it but I was able to put in enough work to take my program to that level to where I could I could compete against a lot of the factory guys that were replacing everything every race and at the end of that season after those podiums did you get a phone call or were you already putting the feelers out there and kind of chasing down people to see if you could get sponsorship you know I was um, I was actually pretty bummed about halfway through the season you know I had uh, uh, three races in a row I had podiumed which pretty much no one else in the field had done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was people that were getting podiums, but three in a row was pretty solid in my opinion. They were all second places, of course. Um, you Not know, first. Yeah, they, yeah, I was always one minute off first place. You know, I had Laughlin Desert Challenge was a two day race. I won the, the second day of that one, lost the first day, missed it by 30 seconds. Um, you know, Parker was another one that mm -hmm. I missed by a short period of time. Um, you know, there was, there was another race. I don't remember which one it was. So you're sitting here thinking I've podium three or yeah. four times that the call should come in. Yeah. I'm like, somebody there, should like, come over here and tap on the yeah. door. I'm like, Nothing. I haven't gotten a call from anyone. I haven't even got a Crickets. shout out on, you know, Instagram from anybody. Nobody, nobody's noticing me. I'm like, what do I got to do here? Mm -hmm. I got to win a big race, win a big race, not podium. I got to win a big or, race or race naked or yeah. Something yeah. Do to something get... extravagant. <laughs> <laughs> so we go to Vegas to Reno, which that year was a two day race. Um, and the first day I won by 20 minutes. And I think that's what really put your stamp on it. Yeah. That's what really, you know, I think people were looking, I just didn't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I killed everybody by 20 minutes, and you know 300 miles which at that time was huge everyone was coming in you know a minute yeah you know it was just post after post i was getting tagged and everything and i was like man this is freaking awesome i did great and i'm sitting there thinking i've got a 20 minute lead going into day two how can i not win this race right i could lose you know every 10 miles i could lose a minute and still still win mm -hmm. so i thought i had it in the bag and of course day two came around and we had a fire, um, which you know was no, no one's fault in the car, other than the fact that um, a top came off of a fuel can and poured all over the turbo and lit the car up. Mm. So we had a fire. We you know blew a bunch of belts, blew some tires back then. You know before we had it all figured out and had just a slew of issues all the way up to the finish line and ended up missing first place by one minute. So. I lost a huge lead on everyone and I'm like, well, that was my chance. I lost it. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of that race, uh, Joey D with UTV Underground was like, hey, man, I want you to come over here. We got we want to do a little interview with you. And I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. You know, mm -hmm. at that point, that was like probably the first interview I ever did. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, man, kind of nervous, <laughs> but here we go. And uh, he's like, hey, uh, you know, the guys at Polaris have been tracking your race. They uh, they were pretty impressed with what you did yesterday. You know, and they've been watching you, but, you know, yesterday was real impressive. It's a bummer you missed out on the win today, but um, they want to present you with something. And I, at that point, I was like, all right, sweet. Mm. This is going to be cool. And, I, and, you know, I'm thinking they're going to say, Plaque. Well, yeah, we'll support you for the rest of the race, you know, or for the rest of the season, you know, which at that point was three quarters of the way over uh, or something small. And, you know, he pulls out his phone and it's a full blown, you know, factory ride contract listing everything that I'm getting in it, you know, ready to rock with my name on it. And I was like, was that Scanlon? Awesome. Uh, no, that, that was Joey that, that had that on his phone from really? Scanlon. Scanlon wasn't there. Oh. Um, but yeah, Joey had it on his phone. And from that point I was like, uh, if you see the video, I'm like, Ooh, thanks guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause I, I didn't know what to say. I was like just shocked. So, um, so that's when it all kind of happened for me. And, uh, yeah, it's a story. So at this point, um, they've handed you a contract on a cell phone mm -hmm. and you're crapping your pants and don't know how to even accept it. But when um, all the lights dimmed out and you went home and you have to deal with that and sign it and go through the details, um, where did they start you off with as far as support and money is concerned? So in your first year, or at least the tail end of that season, Mm -hmm. You know, did it make all the difference? Uh, did it make a small difference? Was it peanuts? Or did it just all of a sudden uh, you can fund a garage and a chase truck and five more cars? 
I, I thought it made all the difference, and, <clears throat> and it did make a huge difference. I'm forever grateful for that first year. Um, but I think my problem was I thought that I thought it changed it forever. You know, I thought I, I thought I was a trophy truck driver, right? So I thought I had endless funds. I thought I could um, support whatever race program I wanted. I thought it was huge. You know, I got a few cars. I could build one, have a pre-runner. You know, maybe sell one, whatever. Um, you know, I got some money and parts budget, whatever. And I was like, man, I'm on top of the world. I can do whatever I want. So I went out. I got myself the top of the line car, <laughs> got myself a uh, Reese Millen chassis built. And, you know, I, I'm now I'm stoked that I have this car. I think it's one of the nicest and most capable cars in the field. But at the time, once I started freaking writing checks and started realizing what I was doing, I was like, God dang, what did I do, man? I should have I should have freaking stayed with that other car. It was doing great. You had um, it sorted out and now mm-hmm. you've got a petulant yeah. teenager. That yeah. you have to rein it, rail in or, or yeah. rein in and figure yeah. out. And, and initially, I thought, you know, <clears throat> same model car, run the same clutching, same axles, same long travel, same this, same that. It's just going to be a better chassis, mm-hmm. you know, because I built my other one all myself, 100% mm-hmm. in, my, in my garage. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm making a killer move. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really kill everybody now. I'm going to finally get that big win I've been looking for, and it just backfired on me. Mm. big time um you know i had i had a brand new car to figure out that i had no idea what i was doing with because i didn't build the car so i'm looking at pictures of reese's car chassis wise yeah you built the car but you got a chassis yeah. to start with yeah i, I didn't build the <coughs> chassis so i welded a million tabs and things on this car i did mm. all the aluminum sheet metal myself mm. um you know assembled the whole car and of course i got the chassis you know it was kind of a last minute deal so i got the chassis the next year right before the Baja 500, we were up till 3.30 a.m. the morning of the race, finishing the car in Ensenada. So, I remember you started that race with zero wrap. Mm-hmm. I think you might have had a Polaris sticker on the side. Yeah, which Maybe. I got in trouble for. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, the car wasn't because pretty? Because the car was so ugly. <laughs> I don't think you even ran a spare tire. Didn't, no. Nope. You had under 10 or 15 miles on the car? Oh yeah, under five miles. I mean, under it, five miles. We on a rolled brand new it car. off the trailer to the start line. <laughs> we, that was all we had. So um, yeah, we finished the race. You know, of course we had we had issues, but um, we finished the race, which I was pretty stoked. You know, lots of people can't even finish the race, and we had you finished this, the race without a spare tire. Yeah, never changed a tire on a car that's yeah. never been shook down. Right. Yeah, it was. It was pretty lucky i i would say impressive because we did put the work in but Mm. i think it was more luck at that point just because it was it was a stupid idea to go down to baja like that but you learn your lessons the hard way i guess so well that's impressive either way Um, some people have you know 15 20 years to sort their car out and can't finish Mm -hmm. it and you had 15 minutes of sorting after the car was built that's pretty cool (laughs) (laughs) yeah i was pretty lucky i think uh i think if i remember right too we took a guess on the shocks on your car Mm -hmm. because we hadn't seen it yet hadn't weighed it yet had no idea what it was going to be and um threw them on there and you started with five miles on the car and i think we guessed heavier on the car which made a stiffer shock setup oh yeah (laughs) and it was so stiff that it may not even even moved much yeah. So you drove that race on a brand new car that probably rode like a skateboard. Yeah, absolutely. It, it rode horrible. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> that's the only time I'll say that to you because my car is great now. <laughs> but when you don't know and you think it's going to be, you know, I kept telling you, oh, it's similar to my other car. You mm-hmm. know, just set it up the same way. Well, I shed, you know, 300 pounds off my other car. I was car. about to say your other so, car was a tank. Yeah. And we were guessing from that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I shed a bunch of weight off of it, got in that car, didn't put a spare in it, which mm-hmm. was huge. There's no spare hanging off the back and went to Baja, one of the roughest races and got my ass kicked. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that's still amazing that you finished. That's for sure. So, um, with all the races that you've run and, um, the years that you've been doing it, what do you think is the biggest accomplishment that you've made so far in your racing career? The 2016 Baja 1000 by far. Brandon and I teamed up and uh, won the race, won our class, and that's huge. I mean, that's the biggest race to win. Did you guys have much effort or work in that race, or was that us get in the car and never get out? Um, you know, the car was great. That was that car was still 
pretty new at that time. That's where you got to learn all the secrets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, no, the car was great. He did a great job prepping it because he mostly did the prep on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and my co-dog Austin at the time, and who's still actually my co-dog on most of my races, um, we got in and we drove it till 1 a.m. and had not one problem. We just got in, took it to Brandon, passed it off. Mm. Uh, we passed it off in second in our class. And luckily he kept that, he held that the whole time and ended up overtaking right at the end, Wayne Matlock to win it, so. That's a super accomplishment because forever you'll be known as a Baja 1000 winner and there's a very, very small group of people yeah. that can say that. Yeah, absolutely. I think even even though Brandon's name is on the entry, I think that um, you know I still got quite a bit of credit for it. And he has to share. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's uh, that was huge for us. I think um, you know if there's if there's any race I've ever wanted to win since since I knew about off road racing, it was the Baja One Thousand. So um, since that's your biggest one, then what's the one thing that you would want to um, accomplish that you haven't? It's on your list. Is there one on the bucket list? Uh, yeah, there's there's a couple on the bucket list. I think the the first the number one race that I'd like to win is the Mint 400, just because it's the Mint 400. Mm. Um, you know, it, I've I've always had horrible luck there, mm. absolutely horrible luck. I've never, I mean, I've gotten some top tens there, which, whatever. Um, <laughs> but but I've never hit the podium at the Mint, and I've always had some catastrophic failure, whether it be uh, an engine, a transmission every single axle on the car, 20 belts. I mean, you name it, I've had the problems at the Mint. And um, not only because it's it's kind of the glory race, but just because it's been my nemesis for a long time, I, mm -hmm. I just wanna, I wanna win it. So, Tame it. Yeah. Um, because what Polaris does directly affects what you have to race, what would you like to see Polaris do with their new cars that would help you the most? I mean, if if, if Polaris is watching this interview right now and they would do what you said, what would that be? Um, build a chassis that's between the two-seater and the four-seater. Mid-wheelbase. Yeah. Yeah, I think that my car, my car is great, but I think it's to the point where it's, it's a little heavier than it should be, being probably the lightest four-seat chassis out there, mm -hmm. um, at least in my <clears throat> opinion. It's still just a little bit heavy and the two-seaters, you know, two seaters are light, they're great, but they're they're just a little bit short. I'd like to have an in-between, you know, a two-seat chassis, but that's that's longer, so it's you know not quite as long as a four seat. Mm -hmm. There would be an in-between so we could shed some weight and um, you know, build build a little bit better car. So you know um, that we do a ton of race teams work. Mm -hmm. um, we scale every single car. Mm -hmm. um, I've pretty much seen everybody that's fast here through here. And I know without telling, uh, we don't share anybody's information from team to team. Uh, we try and keep everybody's stuff comp uh, confidential. But I can tell you that um, you're right in that your four-seater is quite a bit heavier than two-seaters mm -hmm. and quite a bit lighter than most four-seaters. And so I would have to agree with you that yeah. being able to shed the weight and keep wheelbase would be an amazing thing for whoops and rough stuff and, yep. and everything else about uh, the um, benefits come with less weight. Yeah. Well, and being that we race best in the desert and Baja, um, you know, we, we kind of need a car for both because it's hard to have two cars and prep two cars. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the happy medium. This car right now is a Baja car. Uh, you know, so you run a long wheelbase for the big whoops? Yeah, I think and so. And you run a short wheelbase for everything stateside because the whoops yeah. aren't as stacked up. And, and you're not, not only the whoops, but you're not holding it to the floor the whole time in Baja. You're more in survival mode. Mm -hmm. Whereas best in the desert races, I mean, you have, you, you blow one belt, you blow one tire, you're done. Mm -hmm. So you're holding it to the floor the whole time to try to win. And when you have the heavier car and there's guys out there with the lighter car, you have a huge disadvantage. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to admit it, but you do mm -hmm. um, in certain races. So I think the, the mid wheelbase is, is the way to go. Um, who are some of the people that you've idolized? Um, I think Andy McMillan is my biggest idol. Mm -hmm. I think that he's, uh, you know, he, I've watched his videos since he was 18 years old, driving a trophy truck, mm -hmm. out testing and, you know, doing different things. And he's always been the guy that is, 
Um, not only an incredible driver and won just about every race I can think of, uh, but he's always the guy to admit his wrongdoings. He's the guy that's um, he's the guy that puts in the athletics, you know, to still be a to to be fit to be a good truck driver. Um, he's the guy that that is all about safety. He's the guy that's all about his crew. He's the guy that, uh, in most ways, is in my opinion the best and most humble driver there is. So. He's also um, was probably really young when you were really young watching yeah. the videos. Yeah. <laughs> so easy to relate right. from a time in your life maybe you could do it. Yeah, exactly. I think he was, I think he's probably a few years older than me, mm -hmm. but um, I know that when I was young and, you know, barely driving a vehicle on the streets, I saw him driving a trophy truck and I was like, God, that guy's barely older than me. How mm -hmm. is he already doing that? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I could, I could definitely relate to, to how awesome he is, but um, yeah, he's, He's the man in my book. So this might be hard to admit, but um, who are the two people that you race against in your class that are the hardest competitors that you find yourself always having to beat? Uh, two hardest competitors, that's a tough one because there is a lot of good guys in our class right now. That's why I'm, I'm gonna force you to narrow it down to two. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna tell you one of the biggest one is Brandon. One well, that doesn't count. <laughs> you might get the hat for that. Right now, I'm going to let you slide. What's the What's the other one? Um, I think Mitchie is a huge threat. Yeah, Guthrie. N yeah, he's a, he's a great driver, uh, good kid. But I think the thing that's the biggest threat about him is he's not scared to risk at all. He, um, you know, everybody says they go for the points, but in my opinion, I don't think he does. He'll He'll put it to the floor, and if he breaks, he's screwed. But if he doesn't, it's going to be win. hard. It's going to be real hard to catch him because because I'm not willing to do that. I'm um, you know I'll risk it for some races, but in best in the desert, I'd really like to get a points championship. So you know I um, I have a hard time pushing through the dust <coughs> as hard as those guys will and risking it all because I don't want to hurt myself or my co-driver. Because in the dust, you can't see. You're going to hit mm -hmm. a rock. You're going to miss a corner. Yep. It's just um, too dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, you, yeah. Do you ever see yourself not racing? Um, you know, I've thought about that when I get really worn out. <laughs> I think uh, maybe I should take a year or two off, but um, but it never is the reality. I mean, I'm just so it, it's my life now, and I've just kind of gotten used to it. That when I get home from a race, it's a day of rest and back at it. And I think, you know, I always tell people, what, what would I do if I didn't race? Watch TV? I don't like TV. I mean, um, uh, there's nothing else I could see myself doing. I don't like sports. I don't like TV. I don't like video games. So what am I going to do? I mean, <laughs> racing racing's my thing. So I, I don't see myself not doing it. Um, so obviously we've worked together for some time now mm -hmm. and um, I think we work really well together one of the main yeah. reasons is because number one we get along mm -hmm. it's super good <laughs> yeah and um, and we can talk about a lot of stuff that maybe um, bigger companies can't mm -hmm. do sure um, or certain races racers won't do right um, how would you characterize uh, or describe working with us um, when it comes to your car um, and, that, and, and there's a lot of parts on your car. Uh, in, in general, I'm just saying from a suspension standpoint and rack and pinion or any other parts that we have and then working together basically. I, I think the easiest way to describe it is it's a, it's a much more personable experience than any other company. I've worked with lots of the big companies and you know nothing against them, they're good companies, but um, you, know, you go meet them to test your car and there's 20 other guys there and you're in line just like you are at the nearest fast food restaurant going me next me next tune my car tune my car and the reality is they look at you and then they look over at the trophy truck and say yeah hold on give me a minute you know so you're just you're just chopped liver when you go to those and um and you know i have a really hard time with my schedule meeting any of those people um you know they go on wednesdays almost every company i know i don't know what it is about wednesdays but every company i know chooses a wednesday in California to test, which is, couldn't be further from the opposite of my schedule. So uh, that's a huge factor. And I think that here, you know, I don't know how many times you've met me at 6 a.m. for me to drop off my car 
on my way to work or you know let me pick something up on the weekend or meet you at your house or whatever i mean that's that's the big thing for me because with my schedule i just i just don't have time to be a typical customer um does it still ride like crap from the first day that we threw a guess at it in the baja that you finished with no spare <laughs> no absolutely not it rides great now it does it does very well after a couple changes and tweaks it's uh you know before baja i didn't have you change anything so i think it's spot on awesome awesome so i've got some questions for you they're real quick don't think about them just answer them okay all right coke or pepsi pepsi blondes or brunettes blonde ford or chevy ford Beer or liquor? Beer. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Old school or new school? Which one's you? Old school. Uh, Facebook or Instagram? Instagram. Impulsive or logical? Logical. Boxers or briefs? Boxers. <laughs> Got you to blush on that one. How about Jordan or LeBron? Jordan. Thank God. If you said LeBron, this was over. <laughs> so to wrap things up, I hope that you guys enjoy this interview. I know that it went really well, um, and we really look forward to working with you in the future. Hopefully that uh, that'll work for a very long time, and you can get the nemesis of the mint off of your shoulders Hope while so. we're helping. Um, if any of you want to connect with Jake, his social media handles are? Uh, Carver Racing on Instagram and Carver Off-Road Racing on Facebook. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. Hopefully, hopefully we'll see you again. <laughs>